Hi, welcome to this HACCP Awareness webinar video recording. Um, my name is Chris Doherty from FQM. We're going to be going through some uh, awareness and introduction to HACCP. Uh, we'd like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on LinkedIn where we provide lots of free training and resource information. Okay, so what is HACCP? So HACCP refers to a hazard analysis and critical control point system. It's a preventative approach which is used in the food industry and it's predominantly used uh, right from the start of the supply chain, right through the distribution to the point of the consumer uh, eating the product. So it's a powerful product safety management technique and it's a proven structured method for hazard identification and control. So just to refresh again, HACCP refers to hazard analysis and critical control point. So why HACCP? So it's important because it prioritizes and controls the potential hazards in our food production and right the way through our supply chain to the point that it meets the consumer. So we must remember when we're referring to HACCP and the control points, we don't simply just mean the food product itself. We mean the packaging, the labeling, and all of the production and storage activities that go on around the, the supply chain that goes from the raw materials right the way through to the consumer takes the product. So it's used by controlling major food risks, such as microbiological risks, chemical risks, and physical contaminants. Um, the industry brought this about so that it could assure greater consumer confidence in product safety using good science and technology. And again, just stating this comes from not just associated to the food product itself, but all the way back through the supply chain, including the packaging, the labeling, the storage, and the distribution. So every point in the process should be considered from start to end. So what is a hazard? So when we refer to a hazard within the, the food industry, we refer to biological hazards, chemical hazards, and physical hazards. And we break them down a little bit more. What we mean by a, a biological hazard are pathogens, bacteria parasites, viruses, and maybe molds that grow on the product. And generally speaking, the method of control associated to these are around temperature control. So there are critical temperatures that different products must be stored at, but there are, of course, uh, critical temperatures where these bacteria, molds, pathogens, etc., and parasites uh, grow at an exponential rate and we must minimise or eradicate um, the storage of any of these or the distribution of any of these items at these temperatures. When we talk about chemical hazards, what we're referring to here are chemicals that might be used all across the supply chain from the packaging which is manufactured and produced for us, the chemicals that may be used in the process of creating the packaging, the chemicals that may be used in the cleaning of the packaging or the cleaning of the location, warehouse, manufacturing facility and storage distribution areas. So it's important that we recognise and try to minimise the chemicals used, which could have an impact on food safety. But of course, where they have to be used and there is not a replacement, then we must ensure that we identify ways of cleaning those chemicals away out of the material that food can come into contact with. We must remember as well that these could be related to other things like fumes and dust and refrigerants inside our refrigeration systems. So it was important that we have maintenance controls and things associated to that. It also refers to pest control activities that we may have in our facility. 
uh, whether any of the chemicals are used in these activities. And of course, when it comes to maintenance and upkeep of our facilities, we use paints and different activities, different material that if it came into contact with food or the food packaging, it could have detrimental impact on the safety of the individuals consuming it. The last of the three is a physical hazard. This is a physical hazard that can be brought about by the raw material itself not being properly prepared. So it could be that there are uh, fragments of bone or fragments of other activity, other things within the raw material. It could be brought about by humans uh, where uh, jewellery brings about physical contaminants or other items that we use within our facility, uh, paper clips, matchsticks, pens, buttons, so on and so forth. Um, we also have to think about the environment as well. And these could be uh, pieces of glass, wood chips, uh, chips of concrete, stone, tile. And then also we've got to think about the equipment that we use. Uh, could it be the equipment that we use uh, could bring about physical hazards to the, the packaging or the, the, the food product itself, um, where the equipment could release small fragments of dust, small fragments of metal or plastic. Uh, and of course, on top of that, also physical hazards can come from pests as well. Um, so those are the three main areas associated to HACCP in terms of the hazards that we would be looking for. So why use HACCP? So the management of product safety. So it's the commercial implications of a potential major food incident. And I'll talk through a couple of them in a minute. One of the things I just want to stress at this point is that the impact to an organ that it can have on an organization when there is a significant food safety incident. Um, first of all, consumers can lose confidence in the product itself. Uh, this may come about as a result of reputational damage from the press. Um, clients and customers in terms of organizations that may use your services or your, buy your products can lose confidence. Uh, likewise, suppliers may not wish to supply their material into a company who does not have correct controls in place and shown evidence of poor food safety management. Um, but also we have to think about the costs associated to that within an organization. Yes, there are costs uh, we have to build into our systems to run a good food safety management system. However, uh, these should be part of our business activities. And what I would say is that the costs associated to managing a major food safety incident far outreach the cost of a good food safety management system. Traditionally, quality control, uh, the methodology in various production activities was the main route to try to control risks of food safety releasing to the consumer. However, uh, quality control is very much a reactive measure. It's looking at sampling product uh, as it comes off of a particular line, like a, a packaging material being produced. So they, they do a quality control check to check it's not got any particles or any chemicals within it. Similar with the, the food itself, once it's produced, maybe quality control measures are done. But that's it's not a preventative measure. It's much more a reactive and added cost measure at the end of an activity. What a HACCP is about is to try and build in preventative control measures such that we don't need quality control, that we've built confidence in the quality and the safety of our product into the system all the way through the steps. And that's why we look at critical control points as well. We want to recognise the areas where the greatest risks are and put our focus and attention into those critical control points that we have to monitor and record evidence to. Of course, HACCP has been around for a bit of time now. And as a result, um, there are now external pressures on pretty much every organization involved in food manufacturing. Um, so that that pressure comes from your customers, i.e. it could be your, your, your 
a customers like a Marks and Spencers or a Tesco or a restaurant chain, but it can also be the public in terms of the consumer, in terms of what they expect. And also the media has drawn attention to this as well. We've seen this uh, in the press regularly uh, where there has been incidents that have occurred. There's also a whole bunch of legislation around this as well. And of course, international standards that I expect to see HACCP in place. So just three examples of major food incidents that have occurred uh, over the years. Uh, one here in the UK, which was associated to uh, salmonella contamination uh, during uh, some processes. And it identified that 81 people uh, got ill as a result of this uh, contamination of salmonella uh, from eggs. And it cost the organization three million pounds. We have another one which is associated to the USA. And it was a, a, a food production French fry company. And as a result, they had uh, some metal uh, fragments that came from uh, wire bristles in their manufacturing and production processes. And the affected volume was associated to uh, eight million pounds uh, in terms of weight of potatoes that had to be destroyed, which cost the organization four million dollars. And we have a big one associated to Coca-Cola, um, where it was associated to the packaging uh, of their products and there was some fungicide identified and there were 50 million cans which had to be recalled um, after they had gone out through the distribution chain and been sold and that cost the company 60 million pounds. So quite a significant uh, impact to these businesses when you think about these incidents. We often talk about uh, the hidden in, the hidden cost of incidents, and that's important to recognise in these situations. It's not always just the cost of the product that has to be destroyed, but it's the impact it has on your day-to-day -day business activities, the involvement of management and other processes that have to be done to recall products. It's the loss of consumer confidence and the reputational damage it can have as well. There's a whole bunch of legislation around food safety and it starts off with a directive that basically says a proprietor of a food business shall identify any step in the activities of the food business which is critical to ensure food safety procedures are identified, implemented, maintained and reviewed on the basis of following principles. And those following principles are around analysis of the potential hazards in the food business operation, identification of the points in these operations where food hazards may occur. So looking at the critical areas where, yes, there could be hazards all across the business. However, we have a number of those hazards under control, uh, which we will refer to as a prerequisite, we'll talk about later. But what they're really looking at here are what are the, the critical points along our operations where those hazards could occur and therefore need additional measures put in place. We have identification and implementation of effective control and monitoring procedures across all of these points and a review and analysis of those food hazards. So looking at the critical control points, they can change over time and therefore we have to keep on top of them and monitor them regularly. As well as that, we have to remember that there's a safety directive uh, from the European uh, Union, which uh, adapt measures commensurate with the characteristics of the products which we supply to enable them to be informed of risks which these products might present and to take appropriate action. So here we are looking at not throwing everything at our systems, not over engineering our safety practices. We have to remember that we are still a business that's in the, the, the that's looking to make money and produce products and satisfy our requirements. We do the appropriate action to minimize these hazards as much as we possibly can. So when we talk about hazards, we then have to, of course, look at the risk. 
So we have a number of hazards in a, whatever our food uh, manufacturing or production or storage or distribution business is. And we understand what those hazards are. It's part of our business. But we must then look at what the risk of those hazards occurring are. So this is the likelihood based on the consequences as well. So it's an estimate of the likelihood of the hazard occurring and its potential adverse health effects on the consumer. So a definition of a control measure. So it's any action or activity that can be used to prevent or eliminate a food safety hazard or to reduce it to an acceptable level. So this may be, for example, in terms of allergen management. We may recognise the hazards associated to the different allergens that we contain and have within our business. We may recognise that there are a number of control points we have to put in place because we've identified the hazards and where the high risk elements are. And these may be related to, first of all, identifying through our supply chain what allergens are in the various products we buy. We may also then look to put in, in place cleaning processes around that. We may look to put in allergen control and separation uh, activities in place. And of course, we may also want to speak to other persons in our supply chain about the packaging and ensuring that that packaging doesn't get cross contamination from other allergen products. So when we kick off a HACCP, it's not just a one time thing that you do. Um, so therefore, what we do is we look to develop a HACCP team. Generally, it's a multidisciplinary team that would be put in place, uh, normally with a leader, someone that would run and chair these activities um, and be the go to person. Ultimately, quite often this would be someone in your compliance team, food safety expert, or maybe a technical person. But the, the HACCP team where required would have people from maybe quality assurance, food safety, technical, of course, production and engineering. And depending upon the business that you undertake, you may need to involve other people in your organization, your supply chain. So, for example, the purchasing department, you may also have to bring in people if you're very much focused on distribution. It may be the people that run your vehicles and manage the distribution processes you have. And of course, it may also include our human resources team because they are heavily involved in how we recruit people into the business and bring them in. So some of our HACCP control measures will be around the awareness and communication and training that we give new employees when they come to our business. I want to talk a little bit about prerequisite programs. So prerequisite programs are activities which are in place to prevent what we would class as lower potential risk hazards um, from becoming something that's likely to occur and introduce additional risks. So prerequisite programs are things that we know that are in place, work well, and they're fundamentally not something we have to regularly uh, review and monitor and control. They are in place and they've been working. So a well-planned prerequisite program will effectively design out some of our general hazards that apply across the whole process. Therefore, leaving our HACCP to deal with the specific higher risk hazards that could impact our business. And the HACCP really uh, is looking at mainly focused on our critical control points to address those potential hazards that have a stronger likelihood to occur if we don't have these controls in place. So our prerequisite programs can be good manufacturing systems, quality management systems. It could be the methods we have in terms of our personnel health screening and training. Could also be our preventative maintenance programs, our calibration, pest control, and so on and so forth. It's things that we know that work well within our business and have always worked well. Um, if you're new to this type of business and you're new to this activity, it may be that elements of a critical control point now 
once fully adopted and in place, may move into being a prerequisite if these are things that work extremely well over a period of time. So let's talk about how we do a HACCP study. So first we have to define the scope of what the study is going to be. So what are the classes of hazards that we're going to look at? Uh, microbiological, chemical, physical, possibly allergens included in there as well. What about the process and food chain segments? Are we going to look all the way back through our uh, supply chain and our raw material suppliers, our packaging and labelling? And it's good practice. And we have to think about the limits of the study as well. Where are we starting and where are we finishing? Uh, generally speaking, we should be describing the product and identify the, its intended use. So what is it that we are trying to do? Are we manufacturing? Are we producing products for a consumer? Are we producing packaging that are going into food production? Do we have particular storage conditions? What about distribution? Are we involved in the distribution? So we must ensure that we recognize the scope of our study within our business and where HACCPs required before or after our activities, we may look to ask our supply chain or our distribution experts for help and support and identifying what their HACCP controls are. So looking at how we do the study itself, so the first thing we want to do is we want to try and construct a process flow diagram. What this effectively is, is this is a method of demonstrating how material flows into our business and the steps it takes when inside our business. And we must look at some of the critical areas around any specific raw material that need additional controls, any specific process activities that we have to undertake as part of our production or our business activities, any temperature and time control information that we have to record and show evidence associated to this. For example, length of time that a product is outside of controlled freezer or chilled temperatures, the amount of time uh, that it takes um, or any time or temperature that's lost when it's in a distribution vehicle, for example. And also we may want to look at equipment design features as well. Are there things that we want to enhance engineering controls we want to put in place to enhance our controls? And of course, our storage conditions. Um, we want to think about the validation of this process diagram as well. So it should be an accurate representation of the processes at all times. So we must consider um, is it possible that actually our process flow diagrams change at certain times when, when it's a certain time of the year, certain time of the month, for example? So we must try and capture this in all cases. We want to first of all do a hazard analysis. So what are the hazards? So looking at our process flow diagram, and it's good to do this uh, with a multitude of people as part of the HACCP team. So identifying what the hazards are across the full process flow diagram and then drilling down to look at, well, where are the areas of risk associated to those hazards and what control measures do we currently have in place that we know are working? Then we want to look at what critical control points there are required so when a hazard and a control measure have been described, we want to establish the points where control is critical to ensure the safety of the product. So what we mean by critical is if this activity slipped, then we would have a potential major incident in our hands. So these critical control points are where we want to reinforce and ensure that we establish the methods of controlling this. It's a step which control can be applied and is essential to prevent and eliminate a food safety hazard or as a minimum, reduce it to an acceptable level. So when we identify our critical limits as well as that, we have to, we have to uh, 
we have to identify what those are and describe the difference between safe and unsafe product. So, for example, we may talk about temperatures where product of a certain category must be stored in at least minus five degrees C or other products that need to be frozen that may, need to be stored in at least minus 18 degrees C. But we also have to think about the timings that we allow product to transfer from one location to another. And therefore, there is a possibility that these temperatures will rise slightly. And of course, we have to think about the product itself. Which products are more likely to thaw quicker, for example? So let's think about things like bean sprouts and things like that that may thaw much quicker um, if out at room temperature, as opposed to uh, you know a whole piece of meat. So the mass of the product. So we have to consider what those limits are and the timelines around that. And also with that as well, there are different uh, bacteria grow at different rate on different products. So we may need to take external advice on that associated to the products that we have. Um, so yeah, that, that that's the kind of limits we have to look at, okay? So in some cases where it's critical, there may have to be tighter control. If there's tighter control measures required, that would be part of our critical control points that we need to manage and monitor. For example, when I mentioned the period of time that something moves from one location to another, um, or it may be in terms of cooking. Um, so cooking of raw chicken portions, there's a specific time limit around the temperature that you want to be doing it. And you want to try and set this as an ideal cooking temperature. And this identifies what our control point is associated to that. Of course, to support these types of activities, we need to be able to monitor that our critical control points are working, that our HACCP is effective. So we want to have monitoring procedures in place which demonstrate and provide records of evidence that these activities are working. So we have to first of all establish what the procedures are, the frequency of these activities happening associated to the procedures and who takes ultimate responsibility for implementing and ensuring these procedures are working well. And we must be able to identify and detect as quickly as possible where there is a loss of control associated to critical control points. So in that situation, it cannot be left, therefore, to a food safety expert or someone in our quality or compliance team. It has to be everyone's responsibility to get on board with the HACCP and implement and ensure these critical control points procedures and responsibilities are taken. Therefore, when there is a breakdown in these critical control points, a deviation that occurs, people understand the implications and they raise awareness about it as soon as possible. So remember, when we talk about monitoring procedures, it may not necessarily mean individuals. These could be electronic online systems like alarm systems that may be able to be uh, provide alerts to smartphones or email where there is an issue that occurs. It could also be backup systems where one item fails, something else comes on. And these online systems, generally speaking, they provide a, a continuous data record that can be pulled as evidence of what's happening. So for example, that could be online temperature monitoring in a storage facility or on a production line. It could be uh, time and temperature monitoring on distribution vehicles, showing the timing of the route that the vehicle ta takes and the times that the doors are open and the temperature impacts. We also can have offline systems as well, where people are physically undertaking uh, temperature checks, okay? Um, these are requirements of humans to interact with this. So we need to ensure that these practices uh, are undertaken 
they may still be critical, so it's important that we understand them. And then, of course, there can be observation type procedures as well. And this is putting responsibility on everyone in the organization to ensure that we follow the necessary protocols and procedures. And this might include additional checks that are made uh, by supervisors, by production line experts, etc., where they're looking to see if there's any degradation or change in the activities and the hazards within our business. Of course, of part of a hazard analysis and critical control point, the main focus is preventative measures. But we have to recognize that when we do our hazard HACCP study, we will identify areas of weakness. And those areas of weakness should be corrected through a corrective action plan. So the HACCP principle requires that corrective actions to be taken when monitoring results show deviation from critical control. So where we see that our measures are not good enough, we have to put corrective action in place immediately. But where we see that there is a slow degradation or change or deviation, then we have to correct that. This may be that our chilling units are not working as well as they should. Certain vehicles are not functioning to the levels we expect in terms of temperature. Uh, failures in uh, securing of our products or the methods that we have in place to minimize uh, pest control. If, these, if we start to see a deviation in this, we must show that we can put corrective actions in place. So it's likely to have two levels of corrective actions. Actions to prevent the deviation. So we've seen a weakness. So let's get on that and do it. And actions to correct something following the identification of a deviation. So something that has failed, we put the action in place. And there's something we want, might have to do through a containment measure and then a longer term corrective action. When it's something that is showing a trend of weakness, but not yet a deviation, we may want to put that action in place to quickly prevent it causing this deviation in the long term. The corrective action should be de developed again as part of a plan around the team approach, and we want to be able to ensure that everyone's on board. We should then go back and correct our flowchart where we've identified key risks. We may want to make a point on that and have evidence and records to support it. And of course, where there's a requirement of financial input or an impact on our production or our general business activities, often we would need to bring in senior management to be involved in that activity. So in terms of putting the, the, the practice in place associated to the corrective action, we want to establish that the action is working. So we want to validate it as part of our HACCP plan. So is it working? Is the flow diagram we have in place accurate? And does it properly reflect our process? And therefore, that's important that we do this on a regular basis to check it aligns with the activities we do. You know, any business, not just in the food business, any business, we have changes that happen regularly. We have to expand or contract our business activities. We may have to add different production lines, bring in third party support, etc. We must ensure when these changes happen, we update our plan to show that and identify any new hazards we have introduced. And in particular, where we have to put additional critical control point measures in place. And we must ensure that we train all of our relevant personnel. It's essential for the effectiveness of the HACCP to be implemented. And we must be able to provide evidence of awareness training and any specific responsibilities that people have for critical control point monitoring. They need to receive that training so they're aware of what their responsibilities are and the implications if they don't follow this. Of course, we have to think about how we plan the sequence of ob observations that we look at. It may be measurements under certain control parameters and evidence on how that is recorded so that we can show these critical control points are staying within our criteria. Um, 
we must ensure that we keep records of all of this information. As I've said before, often HACCP is a requirement under legal obligations and under international standards, not to mention requirements of our external customers. So therefore, if something has gone wrong and it may not be identified until further out in the process chain, so it could be that you are a packaging supplier and therefore identifying issues or deviations that have occurred in your product may not occur until many months later when it's in use. And therefore you want to ensure that you keep the adequate records so that you can demonstrate and show uh, verification to your HACCP um, where an investigation is required. The verification activities we have to do, as mentioned, are varied. Um, they're a form of validation and verification. They may be through auditing processes. They may be through uh, human interaction in terms of what happens. Uh, and they may be through online uh, monitoring systems. It's important in all cases that these are kept as records. And it's also important that we use this information as part of our data analysis, because ultimately what we want to do is we want to try and see trends or changes that are occurring, and we want to try and drive improvements in our business activities. We want to try and be effective and efficient in what we do, but we want to ensure that we keep our products safe for the use uh, and then consumer. Of course, we have to think about maintenance activities as well. So where there are certain hazards that we've identified associated to equipment, refrigeration, vehicles, storage units, production machines, uh, we have to recognize that there are certain maintenance activities that may include cleaning, that may include the introduction of chemicals and oils, and also could introduce third parties coming to your facility or your uh, equipment or vehicles going to a third party location. Are we confident we understand in terms of these activities that we're not introducing additional hazards? And if, we, if these are arising, what are we doing to control them? What are we doing to bring them back in to align with our HACCP plan? Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to look at this video. Uh, I'd like to just suggest again, uh, if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn, we have lots of free training webinars, introduction information, and of course, we have our free resources on our website. I'm Chris Doherty from FQM. Thanks very much.